Thank you for watching Concord United on YouTube. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest videos. If you'd like more information about our church, please visit concordunited.org. We hope you will take advantage of our many opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. Ha! <laughs> Drums in the sanctuary of the Lord. <laughs> Next thing you know, they'll be bringing in loud electric guitars with any luck at all. No, that, that's, uh, that's wonderful. And, and again, this, this, the music in the service is just, is just the church. It's the church. It's, it's different rhythms, different voices, different music, different instruments, percussion. It's, it's, and, and it all comes together to glorify God. It's a, it's a very beautiful thing. So today is it, right? Super Bowl Sunday. It's the one day of the year. Uh, where we set our DVRs for like five hours of programming and then go back and fast forward through everything but the commercials and actually watch the commercials. That never happens any other time. And I know you're excited about the Super Bowl. Lynn and I, not so, not so excited about the Super Bowl this year because the Patriots aren't in it. And I say that because Lynn, you know, Lynn's from Rhode Island. Her father, he was like two, two and a half hours from Boston. And his Lions Club group used to charter buses and they'd go up to Patriots games all the time. So he was a big Patriots fan. Lynn is. And, and I became a Patriots fan. So, uh, you know, they're not playing this year in quite Quite frankly, we're a little deflated. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, and if that one wasn't enough, if we have any Cowboys fans in here, we appreciate this. You know what? You know what Cowboys fans do right after they win the Super Bowl? Uh, they turn off the Xbox. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Cowboys fans, but it's fun, it's fun to pick on you. <laughs> but anyway, it is Super Bowl, and I have, something, I have something important to say about the Super Bowl. I take a look at this picture. Uh, this, is, this is Don Chrisman, Gregory Eaton, and Tom Hanschel, all 80-somethings, who belong to a very small, very exclusive club that's getting smaller every year, and you might be able to guess what this club is. They have been to every Super Bowl, including the NFC AFC championship game in 1967 before it was even called the Super Bowl. They didn't start that till 69. They've been to all of them. Two of them have been to the games together since 1980, and another one of them joined them in 2000. They just met at these games. Uh, one of them mentioned that tickets now cost 400 times more than they did for the 1967 NFC AFC championship game. Tickets for this year's game, I think they'd paid $2,500 dollars a piece then those are for cheap seats but but they come together because they have learned that being together and watching these games is far better than going to the game separately and in fact it's really as much of the whole thing as it is going to the game they love each other's presence they love the camaraderie and they love coming together to to this to experience this 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 wonderful event and being together elevates the event. And so it has become for them a rather expensive one, but it's become their custom to do so. And I'll use that word custom very intentionally uh, because we're going to read one verse of scripture from Luke that uses that word very uh, intentionally and hopefully we'll tie all this together. This is from Luke chapter 4. We're going to read verse 16. It comes on the heels of Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And then Jesus comes home. He comes back to Nazareth, which is his hometown. Yes, he was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth. And it's like local boy done good and he's coming back home to preach in the local synagogue there, and we have this one verse that I want to park on for a minute from Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and this is what it says. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. You know, it's always okay to underline your Bible or highlight. And if you have a Bible and you want to underline those four words, they're the four words we're going to hang on for a few minutes this morning, as was his custom. A custom is anything that we do habitually, and, and it, it helps to bring identity. It's true for individuals. It's true for groups of people, sometimes large groups of people, ethnic groups and national groups. We, we all have these customs that identify who we are 
and, and what we're all about. We also could call them habits, and we'll, we're going to call them both this morning because we're continuing our sermon series called Healthy Habits, where we're looking at the five points of uh, the vows of membership, which you just heard a minute ago, and they help define who we are as disciples of Jesus Christ. And we say we'll, we'll support the church with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. All of those are healthy habits or customs, I might, uh, I might also say this morning morning that help identify us as members of this congregation and more largely members of the body of Christ. And they, and they form us as, as customs do. You know, Jesus, you could say, you could say that because Jesus was the sinless son of God who was born of a virgin, he was custom made. Anything that's custom made is a one-off. There's not another one like it. But I would also submit there's another way to hear that. Um, Jesus was also a human being, very much 100% human being, a devout Jewish man who followed these customs uh, that involved also going to the synagogue, which we're going to bear down on this morning. But, but it, was, it was through practicing these customs that also made him into the man that he was. And the same is true for you and me. We are all custom made because the customs and rituals that make us up our life will make us who we are. The question is, which habits and which customs will we repeat and give a chance to shape us? There are some bad ones out there. There's some really good ones, and we're going to park on one this morning. Um, Jesus' custom that we want to park on now is the, his custom of going to church or, or the synagogue. There are, there are at least 10 scriptures in the New Testament that talk about Jesus going to the synagogue. And, and there's, a, there's another passage in Luke where it says that he was in the temple every day teaching. And this was important to Jesus. And you know I, what I say, if it's important to Jesus, it ought to be important to us as well. And, and let's talk for a minute about synagogue so we don't think, well, yeah, but he went to the synagogue and that was different. Well, hang on. Might not be as different as you think. Uh, the Greek word in the New Testament was written in Greek, and that Greek word for synagogue can mean two things. It can mean the people who gather together, and it can also mean the place where they gather now, some of you who are astute may go, huh, that sounds, that sounds like the church. Bingo, it does, because the church is both the people who gather together in the name of Christ, and we also call the place where we gather the church. So there are interesting parallels between the synagogue and the church. The synagogue was a place where people came together to pray, to sing songs of praise and hymns. A lot of times they sang the Psalms like they did in the temple. Um, they heard the scriptures read and they heard them interpreted. You could loosely call that a sermon. They supported each other and it was a community center. Think about that. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, there, there are places where we separate there, but it's a really interesting parallel between the synagogue and the church. And, and I want to lift that up this morning and also say this, that perhaps the single most important thing about the synagogue is also the single most important thing about the church. Synagogue worship started whenever the people had been exiled into these different places, these Gentile nations, we'll call them. And they couldn't get back to the temple to worship. And so the Jewish people who wanted to maintain their faith would gather together and eventually they started building buildings and sometimes they met in people's homes, but that would be called the synagogue, the place where these people came together to practice their faith. And one of the most important things that the synagogue did was remind them of their identity as children of Abraham, as part of God's chosen race, the Jewish people, to remind them of their identity in a foreign land. And I would submit that that's an important thing that the church does today as we gather together, recite the Apostles' Creed, sing the songs of faith, pray, hear the word of God proclaimed. It helps us remember who we are in what sometimes feels like a foreign land. But remember, we're called to be in the world, not necessarily of the world. We want to make sure that we are evangelizing others and that the world doesn't start evangelizing us. But that's what the church is, is about. It's about helping us shape our identity so we can go out those doors and tell others about how, how wonderful this God is that we find in Christ Jesus. So to do that, to talk about presence, and that's what we're going to talk about. Last week was prayers. This week it's presence. I want to talk about it in two ways, and I'm going to use a metaphor that I've used before about our spiritual life, and that is the metaphor of breathing. Breathing. 
We breathe in spirituality, we breathe in spiritual things, and then we breathe them back out into the world. It's very Wesley and John Wesley being uh, one of the founders of the movement that now all these years later is the United Methodist Church. He talked about breathing in God by practicing the um, by practicing. Uh, Holy Communion, by prayer, means of grace, he called it, uh, by, by prayer, by reading scriptures, doing these things to breathe in this spirituality. And then we breathe it back out into the world very individually is who we are. And I want to think about that for a minute this morning, breathing in, breathing out. You can't do one or the other. You have to do both. If you only do one, eventually you will pass out and fall over and hopefully wake up and keep living. But we cannot survive if we only breathe in or only breathe out. We must do both. And both are crucial if we are to participate in this, this presence in the body of Christ. And let me talk about it for a minute. What do we breathe in when we go to church? There are a lot of things. We could, we could plug a lot of different items in that we experience in church. But I want to collect it all into one and say we breathe in community. And God is all about community. I've said this a couple of weeks ago. I've said it many times. We think of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit as the first family. They were the original community. God is a community. God exists in community with God's self. And as an expression of that, then, Christianity is all about community. That was whenever Jesus, who was the flesh and blood incarnation of, of a member of that original community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, came and established his, his kingdom here on earth. Now, I suppose he could have done it by himself. He was, after all, not only fully human, but he was fully God. He could have done that, but he didn't. How did he choose to do it? He created a community. He chose 12 disciples, the very first Christian community of people, to come together and to listen to him teach and to serve with him and then to go out and to proclaim him into other towns and villages. And so Christianity is all about community. And we breathe that in when we are in church. And it's crucial for us if we are to be healthy Christians in the world because at the, at the bottom of all this and at the very core, let's put it that way, the essence of this community is love because that's what formed it in the first place. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The whole reason Jesus came was so that we could, it could experience God in person, the person of God in the world, his personal presence. We could experience that. And, and that then became the core of, of this community. So the community is all about love. And when we gather as the body of Christ, then we find the presence of God in that community. And we breathe that in. They were all about that in the early church over in, uh, in Acts chapter four. And I've lost it right now. It's Acts, actually it's Acts chapter two. I love this. I love this. This was after Peter had preached his big sermon on Pentecost. You know, the Holy Spirit had come and the tongues of fire landed upon them and they all started speaking in these different languages that all the people who had come into Jerusalem for, for a Pentecost could understand. And then Peter preached this sermon and many people were saved that day. Well, after that, it says this. Every day, they, this, this, commu this initial little community of faith, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and, and I love this, I had missed this until this week when I was studying for this sermon. They broke together and they, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They were enjoying the favor of each other. There was this beautiful sense of presence and this, this, this beautiful joy that came from being together. And we never want to miss that because that's part of who we are. Paul put it this way, uh, and, and we're going to talk more about gifts next week. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, Paul says this, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And what he was saying was, if you were to break that language down, you is plural, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you individually is a part of it. And, and this is what I want you to take away from that, if I can get it all back here. Here we go. Individually, not one of us can be the body of Christ. 
but together we cannot help but be. We are the body of Christ when we are together. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we are the body of Christ, and it's non-negotiable. It just happens. But we can never be that on our own. And the reason that's so is because it's in, it's when the body is together that we experience that love, that favor of all the people, and we breathe that in in a way that we can't anywhere else. And that happens online now, and we know that many people worship online, but there's still that sense of community where we are as one together and we breathe in that, that beautiful love that God intended for this community. So we breathe that in. And then, and that's just one thing. So, so coming to church, being present in church, is not just all about us and getting what we need. We breathe it out. We have to breathe out. Remember, we can't live without full, a full respiration cycle of breathing in and breathing out. Jesus taught in the synagogues. Why? Here's your smart aleck answer. Because he could. Because he was good at it. Jesus could teach like no one else could teach. He also healed. But, but I, think Jesus, I think Jesus gained favor from the people in the synagogues. Yeah, there were some people who were after him. Some of the Jewish leaders who were intimidated by him, wanted him gone. But a lot of the people, a lot of people really liked Jesus. And I think, in, in fact, when he went to preach in his hometown synagogue at first, it said that, that people were favorable to him. And then some of the leaders, I don't think, liked some of the things he was saying uh, about how the scriptures were fulfilled in him. But that's not, that's not what's important today. What's important is, is that, that we find community there and then we breathe ourselves out. Jesus did the one thing only he could do in those synagogues. That was to preach with authority, to teach with authority, and he did. So he breathed out his unique person, if you will, his unique personhood back into the community and no one else could do that. Let me read one more little passage here as support. This is from Hebrews. And some of you may be thinking, uh, oh, I know this is the one that where Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews gets on people about not coming to church. Of course, he's going to preach that one. He's going to make us feel guilty about it this morning. I don't even, I'm going to hit that a glancing blow. There's another part of that passage to me that's far more important, and I missed it until this week. Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 24 and reading verse 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We, we can breathe ourselves, our person, if you will, out back into the community and we can encourage we can spur each other on and you have no idea what that can mean to somebody you may never know but it happens it's true one of the you know there have been so many wonderful people i've met at this church that have gone on to glory in the going on 21 years that i've been here but i, I was thinking this i was thinking actually a couple of days ago as i was working on the sermon i was thinking about john lovell and m many of you probably most of you at this point don't know john lovell some do john's been gone for a good long while and his wife m lived after he died but she's gone now too john was a big tall man he was a brilliant man and when I first started preaching, he would, I'd pass him in the hallway out here and he would always stop me. And he had this, he had this, always had this attaboy look on his face and he would go, you really got it said this morning, young man. I just loved what you said. And then he would, he would very intentionally say something that he knew that would make me realize he, he was listening, he processed and he connected it. And he wanted to encourage me that way. And you can't imagine I'd heard about him, and you can't imagine what a, what a man like that saying something like that to me meant when I was just trying to find my place in, in this church. Later on, as he got older, um, he, his, his mind be, be, became lost in the fog, if you will, and there were cognitive difficulties as he got older. And it got to the point where he couldn't, he couldn't connect all the dots and put everything together in words, but I would see him in the hallway with him, and he still had that look. He would still give me that, that attaboy look, and he would say, you, you, you just keep going, or he would try to say something. He didn't have to say anything. 
because it was just who he was to me. It was his person. He was expressing that to me. And the encouragement, we talk about spurring somebody on. And I think it meant more to me when he became unable to fully express himself than it did at first because that was his heart. It's who he was. He was an encourager. And there are lots of them in this church, and I could name names right now of people in this room that, that intentionally encourage me, encourage so many other people. But that's the way we breathe back out. We breathe in this love of community, and then we breathe it back out, and nobody can do that for you. In Paul, in, if we were to go further into 1 Corinthians 12, Paul has this beautiful example of the body of Christ and all these different gifts. And his point is that none of them are the same. Nobody can be you in the church. It's like a fingerprint. You know, our fingerprints in, involve ridges and whorls and, and, and loops and, and all these different components that come together in, in totality. And they make a very unique fingerprint for each one of us. And what's fascinating to me about the body of Christ is, is we can all individually hold our fingers up and go, well, you know, there's Trotter and there's so-and-so. But when we all stand up and if we, if we were to hold them together, if we could all stand and hold our fingers together, no matter what configuration of the body we are, but in here this morning, for instance, then what you would see is the fingerprint of God. The body of Christ is the fingerprint of God in the world. And each unique fingerprint comes together to make that happen. Think about your family. Think about if there's someone in your family that, that is just iconic. And it may be somebody for me when I was going through this exercise, everybody I came up with is already gone. Uh, some of these characters in our family that I love so much and just typified our family, they're gone now, but they still live here. But nobody could replace them. When they've gone, whatever, whenever, if they died, if they moved away, nobody could replace them. And I'll bet there are people in your family like that, that are irreplaceable. You can't just plug and play. They are who they are, and they bring their person to your family, and it makes it uniquely your family. That's what you do. That's what I do in the body of Christ. And here's a truth. As a Christ follower, the body of Christ will be incomplete without your presence. Did you realize that? Nobody can take your place. That's why it's so critical that we are present in, in worship or at the thrift store to work or for on community care night coming up, that we're present for these things, that we take our place in the body of Christ because nobody else can take your place or take my place. That's how unique you are. And there are always extenuating circumstances that, that you know, we, we you know, Paul, Paul wrote from prison. He was in prison a lot of the time, but I think he probably always felt like he was part of the body of Christ. And sometimes we get sick and sometimes we just can't be in person. We can be online and, I, and we, we consider online and in person the same, you know, because they're, we're, you're part of, part of this group. You're desiring to be part of the body of Christ and you're welcome. But it doesn't matter. And, and sometimes people will stay away because they say, ah, you know, I don't really have that much to offer. Well, that's just an affront. That's just an affront to God. You're telling God he messed up whenever he made you. He doesn't mess up. You have a place that's, that's uniquely yours. And here's the deal. Our presence is more about who we are than what we do. And nobody else can be you. <laughs> and people make all sorts of excuses and, and because they miss the power of breathing in, breathing out that community. One of the churches I served, there was a lady, her husband came to church all the time and she never came, never. And uh, one night she called me because they'd had a family crisis and she wanted to talk to the pastor. So I talked to her, I prayed with her over the phone and it was wonderful. And she, you know, in the course of the conversation, she said, I guess you wonder why I don't come. And I said, well, you know, I mean, I can't help but be curious because your husband's here, you know, very regularly and very much a part of it. And she said, well, I'm very embarrassed, but I will tell you the truth. I will tell you what happened. Once, some years ago in that church, they have these bean suppers. Lots of churches have bean suppers and people bring different kinds of dried beans together and they bring these big pots of beans. And part of what they would do is people would also bring their homemade chow chow. And that was a big deal. And boy, and you know, a, a nice bowl of, of uh uh, pinto beans with somebody's homemade chow chow and some cornbread. Hallelujah. Why are we talking about food? I'm hungry. Let's go now. But, 
But she, some, she, she was one of those bean suppers, and she overheard two people talking, and they disrespected her, chow chow. <laughs> and she never went back. True story. And that's just so missing the point. You know, I would say it's not about us, but it really is. It's all about us. But it's all about us coming together to create the presence of Jesus. That's why our presence is so important. It doesn't matter if somebody made us mad. It doesn't matter if we can't do what somebody else, what we think somebody else can do. It doesn't matter where we think we are in the hierarchy of gifts and, you know, what we're good at and what we're not so good at. None of that matters. You are unique and only you can be you and it's only when we are all together that fully the presence of Christ is experienced. That's why your presence and my presence is so important. Changes things, just being present. I'm doing a Kids Hope uh, mentor. I'm being a Kids Hope mentor again this year. And and I have the same student I've had now for four years. We kind of missed a year because of COVID and we exchanged letters, but we didn't get to be together. But he's a fifth grader now. And he's changed a lot. He's gotten very quiet as he's gotten older, even though we know each other better to a certain extent. And so we play Legos. It's what we do. We get together and we've done it now ever since we've been together. We take Legos and we dump them out in the middle of the table. And if there are instructions, those go back in the bag and get put under the table. We don't care about instructions. That's not about, we don't follow anybody's rules. We just build what kind of comes to mind. And I build a little structure and he builds a little structure. Sometimes we'll try to build them together. And there are times in 45 minutes, we don't say five sentences to each other. And you know what? It's okay. Because we're together. And sometimes he'll go, oh, that's, that's pretty cool right there. Or I'll say, tell me about this structure right over here. And sometimes he'll say, I got a basketball game Saturday. I didn't play very well last week. Ah, oh, well, you'll do better this week. And these things just sort of come out. But mostly, it's just being together. And just this past Wednesday, when I was walking him back to his classroom, he looked over at me as we were walking and he said, are we going to do this next year? And I said, buddy, it's, it's not for middle school. He's, he'll, he'll go to middle school. I said, it, it's not in middle school. So no, we won't. I wish I could because this is really important to me being with you every week. And he goes, oh. And it just, it, it meant the world to me that he asked that question. I've been asked that question by students before. It's just, it's just being present. And that's what it's all about. It's not mean, it's not what I can do for him or what he can do for me. It's just being present, breathing it in, breathing it out. That's the body of Christ. It's a privilege and it's a responsibility. Nobody can take your place. I pray that you'll take that seriously And just be present. Watch the transformation begin. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you. Thank you that that we can consider ourselves custom made. That these customs that have been handed down by tradition, the customs that we read about in your scripture, that they all make us into who we are. It's mind-boggling that you give us a place in your kingdom and that you you would place that much importance on us being together. But we know it's a big deal. And Lord, we thank you. Help us by the power of your spirit to to always remember how important it is for us to be present to us and to others so that Jesus may be known. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.